Bill mentioned, <clears throat> we are in the, today is the 42nd day of our count to Pentecost. This completes today the, seven, the sixth full week of the seven week plus one day count to the feast. And we know what happened on that day in history. The church was set alive with a miraculous outpouring of God's spirit and an astonishing display of power. And that spirit is continuing with us to, to this day. It is still with us here. That church has never ceased and that spirit lives within us. But now we are in a surely what I think all of us will agree, this is the time of the end. We are in the last days. We don't know how long it will be, but the signs are everywhere that we are certainly there at that, this point. I mean, we could look around at the world scene and we see just in the last few years, a, a revitalized uh, Europe that is now looking to defend itself against a threat from its eastern border, which would be Russia, as the war in Ukraine broke out, and that has brought Europe together in a way that uh, had not happened for since the end of World War II. And then we also see a, a lar very large power block with China and a um, resurgent uh, China and Russia uh, getting together. Uh, we also look at the pariah status of Israel in the, in the world today, so pariah with status being that they are very much maligned and hated. And then we have to look at our own country and the, the ballooning national debt. So the signs are everywhere. That was the point of going through the couple of points there to show you we are definitely there. As Christ said in these times, in the times of the end, he prophesied that the love of many will wax cold. That's what we see now. I see it more and more, especially since COVID. I, I see more people just being more rude, uh, curt, and uh, especially, I always like to say, the roads are a one, not a wonderful, but a, a dramatic example, I think, of what we're seeing, the, uh, the way people drive today. It's worse than I've ever seen. The perilous times are coming, and I think, we all agree they're here and they will grow much worse. But what will precipitate it? What will finally be the time of the end? We don't know. No one knows for sure, but God assures us the worst of mankind's history is yet ahead. When there will be tribulation, as such as not seen since the beginning of the world. But there must be something different about us. Our love cannot be growing cold in a world that's growing mad. We cannot be doing that. What will be different about us? Because what will be different is that we have that spirit in us and it is guiding us in our practice of God's law. That's what makes us different. When we practice the law in its fullest intent, we fulfill the law and the intent of the law is love. If we are truly practicing God's law, we are showing love for God and also love for our neighbor. That's what will make us different because we keep that law, which is a law of love. On the last Passover of Jesus Christ, he gathered his disciples for that last uh, a occasion with them before he was taken away. And he gave them a new commandment, a new commandment. I know you're familiar with this verse. A new commandment, he said, I give to you. This is John 13, verse 34. I give to you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Well, what was the new part of this commandment? It really was an, a new way to look at an old commandment because the intent of the law had always been love, as we'll see. That was always God's intent. But what was new? What was new? It was Christ's demonstration of love. He showed us what love is. He showed us, by example, the love of the Father for us, revealed to us that love. That was new. And he demonstrated it to the fullest extent by laying down his life and sacrificing, allowing himself to be sacrificed. <clears throat> 
The title of the sermon today is A New Commandment. A New Commandment. And this is to show what, what Christ meant. To look at this new commandment and see what it means for us. Look at it, the practical application of this commandment to ourselves. As he said that night to them, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And that's what he did, showed us real love. That is what made this commandment new. And by this he said, by this he said, this is John 13, verse 35, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is what's going to set us apart from the world when the times grow uh, even worse than they are now. We know they are getting worse. Right now we have economic, <laughs> I guess you could say prosperity. Uh, I wouldn't say security. I wouldn't say we could uh, say the, the, the economic situation will continue to be good. I think at some point things are going to fall apart. Things will fall apart. But this will set us apart when it, that happens. How, it is how we love one another. When Christ began his ministry, the people who heard him knew there was something different about the way he taught them. There was a, a profound departure from the norm. This is not the normal teaching they would hear from the scribes and the Pharisees. He didn't fit the mold of the mainstream, if you will. He was different. He didn't teach different commandments, but he taught the fullest application of the law. He didn't do away with the law. As he said in Matthew 5, 17, we know this verse very well, don't think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to take those things away, to throw them away. I did not come to do that, but I came to fulfill it. I came to show how to fulfill the law. He, sh he came to show the fullest intent of the law by his examples. For, ex for instance, he said to us, love your enemies, love your enemies, and bless those who curse you. He declared that is our responsibility to all men. He said, do that to your enemies. And God's, why does God say that? Why does he say that? Why does he say love your enemies? Because he sees the potential in that person. He sees the potential for that person to become a son of God in the kingdom of God. And so he chooses to, to forgive. As we know, even to his dying breaths, he asked his father to forgive those who were killing him. I've used this example before. I, I know you know my story very well about what happened to us in my daughter's case, but I chose to forgive a person who had done me wrong by killing my only daughter. But to me, that was the only right choice. Why did I think that? It was because the Spirit of God was leading me into that decision. There was nothing else that made sense to me other than choosing to forgive. I remember sitting with the prosecutor before the sentencing. We were sitting in a coffee shop in somewhere outside of Cleveland and he asked me what I thought of the death penalty because in this case, the death penalty could be applied. And I thought, I told him what I thought. I said, this man has ruined his life, but God has a purpose for him. If he is put to death, there is an opportunity for him to be, I, I think I may have used the word fixed. His life could be whole again. I truly believe that. And the prosecutor looked at me and he was stunned. He was stunned because he could see that I truly believe this man had every chance to be in the kingdom of God. And that's the way God looks at each one of us. He sees that potential in us, each one of us, and he tells us 
to love our enemies. That is the whole purpose of the law, to love God and love our neighbor, to love those. The people who heard Christ's teaching, we look at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mountain, after they had heard how God, how Jesus Christ explained to them the fulfillment of the law, how to apply the law of God, they were stunned. They were astonished and they said, this is different. He's teaching us something we haven't heard. This man is teaching with authority. He knows the law. He understands the application of the law of God. That was different. How to apply it to ourselves. He showed them how it was to be fulfilled. So when times are bad, and they will be bad, and I think they already are, we've, we're, we see many, much evil in the world, men will turn ugly. You know, we want, I wonder what will happen if uh, we don't have food security. Just think about that, how, how quickly things could degenerate if there was no food, if people couldn't eat. <clears throat> how would they look at somebody who had food? <laughs> would they... Um, just be kind and ask? Or would they go and take it and even kill for what they want? I think you know the answer to that. What, that's what we can expect is coming in our, in our world today, a, a total breakdown of law because men are not keeping the law of God in their hearts like we are called to do. They're not fulfilling the law of God like we are called to do. It wasn't long before his last Passover that I referred to that a man asked Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment of the law? What, what is the greatest? And this is what he said. You know it very well. It's in Matthew 22. A lawyer asked him, this is verse 35 of Matthew 22. A lawyer asked him, he tested him saying, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Where did Jesus Christ get that statement? <clears throat> Comes from, directly from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. <clears throat> If I could ask somebody to get me a drink of water, I appreciate that. <coughs> Thank you. So he quoted from already what was in the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment Christ continued in his answer to the, to the lawyer. And the second, like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Where did that come from? He quoted it directly from Leviticus chapter 19. On these, two, on these two commandments, God said, hang all the law and the prophets. Everything is fulfilled in that, loving God and loving your neighbor. So this has always been the intent of the law as we see it directly quoted from the Old Testament this is why Christ said to us, love one another as I have loved you. And we're not to be just hearers of the law, but doers of that. And this touches all of our human relationships. This goes down to the thoughts and intents of our heart, how we treat all men, how we treat our neighbor, how we treat our family, how we treat our brethren. It goes down to every every human relationship. Thank you very much, appreciate that. <clears throat> Recently, I had some congestion in the throat, apparently I just decided to come back for a few moments there. But let's look at some practical applications now in the, in the New Testament, because really the New Testament is filled with practical application of the law of God. So here's a major point, that love fulfills the law. Love fulfills it. Romans 13, verse 8. 
Romans 13 and verse 8. <clears throat> Paul's writing, of course, <clears throat> to the Romans, and he says to them, Owe no one anything ex except only this. This is what you owe all men, to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law, the whole law. That is the fulfillment of it. So what would your neighbor say about you? How do you show love to them? <laughs> you know, we're sitting with our neighbors here today. Each one of us are neighbors of each other. What would our brethren say about us? What would our family say about us? For the commandments, he continues, you shall not commit adultery, not murder or steal, bear false witness, not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's all summed up in this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The same thing that Christ told the lawyer. The commandments then are the guideline for all of our behavior. All of it. So ask yourself, how do my actions <clears throat> fulfill the law of love to my neighbor? So let me give you just a few mundane examples from, I call them mundane, from my own life. Things that I think about, and I was writing this sermon and thinking, okay, well, what are some things that I would do when I'm thinking about my neighbor? So in my neighborhood, I have, uh, we have, a, uh, we had a home up in Ohio and there we had snow. Now I know it's 100 degrees today here in South Florida, but we had snow during the winter there. And our, our driveway <clears throat> apron emptied out into a section of the neighborhood where people would walk on the sidewalk, uh, then down our apron across, across the street. Uh, the people did it all the time. This was what I would call the neighborhood loop. If you wanted to walk around the neighborhood, you walked down the sidewalk, and then they took a left turn at Deemer's apron, and then down the apron across the street. And during the winter, I would think, well, I, I went out there and I saw footprints in the snow. <clears throat> and I thought, hmm, you know, I, I better make sure that's shoveled. So I made sure that portion of my driveway, that area of the sidewalk and apron was shoveled because I felt, you know, if it were my if I was out there walking and I came to a house that didn't shovel their driver or walk, I, I would think, well, why don't they? So I, that was just one mundane example, I'll say. Um, another one, you know, I go to, we all go to the grocery, the Home Depot, or wherever we go, and there's, we pull into the parking lot, and, and there's a shopping cart, oftentimes, right there where we wanted to park. What do we do? Go, do we go to another one, or do we just leave it there for somebody else? Well, sometimes maybe we need to go and park somewhere else, but it, it gets to me. I think, well, if I just leave that there, somebody else will have to deal with the same thing that I'm, I'm leaving them the same problem. So I say, I'm going to take that uh, shopping cart, and I'm going to take it up to the store. Now that, I know it's a very routine thing, but it's just showing you an example of thinking of what others would face by your behavior, which goes, of course, to much bigger issues than shoveling your sidewalk or moving the shopping cart. It goes to much bigger issues than that. There are countless ways that we could demonstrate love toward our neighbor. The Apostle James likens the law of God <clears throat> to someone who looks in a mirror. So you look in a mirror, this is James 1, look in the mirror, and that's the law of God looking back at you. You see your face there, and you see how you stack up to the law of God, and you say, well, what is it about me that doesn't line up with this? And then you say, oh, I need to make that change or do this change. Well, the one who is, as James says, a forgetful hearer, he just puts the mirror down and walks away, but he doesn't think about what he just saw or do anything about it. Well, we must, if we are truly fulfilling the law, we're looking at ourselves in that mirror and saying, how do I stack up? Where are my behaviors in relation to that law? And then we take that to heart, put it in our mind, and then we go do something about it thus fulfilling the law.
not being a forgetful hearer. As Christ said, the law even goes to the thoughts and intents of our heart. And he demonstrated that in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, which was why it was so astonishing. Even thinking about hating your brother, that's murder. And even lusting after a woman in your mind without doing anything, that's adultery. <laughs> that goes to the very intent of the heart, unlike anything they had heard before. But that is the full application of it. As I said, the New Testament contains very much instruction on the practical application of the law of God, of loving our neighbor. So let's look at a few in Romans chapter 12. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. We, normally we go to Romans 12, we read verses one and two, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But if we read down to more of that chapter, we find a very long list of actions, of practical applications, of taking the word of God and applying it to our lives. So let's take a look at a couple of them. As he, as he starts out, let love be, verse 9 of Romans 12, without hypocrisy. Don't love for personal gain. Mean, be genuine in your love. Now, we're, there's an example in scripture in the early church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? What they thought to do, they sold a piece of property. Then they came and reported it to the apostles and said, we've sold our property and here is what we got for it. But they held back a portion of that and the Holy Spirit revealed that to Peter. And to set an example of what, how God thinks of that, they were killed. But the Spirit killed them as soon as they appeared. Uh, first Ananias and then Sapphira coming in, in the presence, pretending something for the sake of, sh of gain. This was, as, as Paul said, let love be without hypocrisy. They were showing hypocrisy. And so that is an example right from the beginning of the church to show us don't do that. I wonder, brethren, do we see that today in the church? Is that in the church today? Let's ask ourselves that question. Do we see that? It shouldn't be there. We shouldn't see that at all. A real act of love doesn't seek reward from or gain from that, only to be accepted by our Father in heaven. Remember what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount again. Remember this, he said, take heed, this is Matthew 6 verse one, that your charitable deeds before men, don't do your charitable deeds to be seen, just to be seen and say, well, look how good he is. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Don't do that. But the only pleasure you really should be looking for is that your act does, is recognized by the Father, is recognized by your Father in heaven. So continuing here in Romans 12, verse 10, be kindly affection one to another, give preference to one another. And among ourselves, brethren, we have a lot of opportunity to practice this to be kindly affection to one another. You know, I've been at this, I've said numerous times, I've been in the church for over 40 years, and I can guarantee you I'm not perfected in love yet, but I keep working on it. And there was a time, for instance, in our Christian experience, I, we know the church was blown apart by the heresies of the 90s, and people landed in different spots. Well, I ended up in a small independent group after the, the big blow up of the church in that time. And I, that's why I stayed for a number of years until Will and I met in the early uh, 1999 and married in 2000. And a few years later, we began attending United full time. But while we were there in that church, I'm thinking, here's the United Church of God. 
with all these brethren and all of these opportunities for me to practice love. This was a compelling reason for me to say, you know, we get, we're okay over here in this small group, but I'm wondering what God would say, what Christ would say, if I stood before him and, said, and Christ said, look, I gave you this very, very great body of believers over here. Again, not a perfect body, of, certainly not, but to have a lot of opportunities to practice love toward neighbor. And I can tell you, brethren, I've never looked back. That was really the compelling reason I said, I couldn't stand before God and say, I just wanted to be off by myself. I want to be part of a, a larger body where I can practice my faith, where I can practice being perfected in the law of love. And that's what God's given us here. Each one of us, and we, we bear with one another, we, we stay with one another, we continue to support one another. And over the years, we begin to be more perfected in love. That's what God wants to see in us. Practicing love toward our neighbor. As Romans continues, verse 11, not lagging in diligence, <clears throat> fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And you know, when I was uh, a past life, <laughs> I was a factory manager of several uh, manufacturing operations, and I always appreciated the person who did what they say, who was diligent and did what they say, followed through. That was so pleasing because I had to worry about getting all of the work done, all of the production out and completed and had to worry about um, the bosses looking at the financials as well as the product getting shipped every day. When somebody did what they said, I was very pleased with that. As parents, we could, I've been, a, a parent, and I've said many times, it's one of the best jobs I ever had. I loved being a father. I loved being a dad. And I always appreciated when my children would follow through and do what I asked them to do. So we could look at the way God looks at us. Do we follow through with our commitment and our, are we diligent in his eyes to practice the way of love? fervent in spirits, as it says here, serving the Lord. As it continues, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. And then he also mentions the, our responsibility to look after one another, distributing to the needs of the saints. If you see a need, you take care of it. As we remember from James, the, the apostle James says, if a brother comes to you in need and said, I have need of, of something and you say well be warmed and filled and be be on your way and you don't do anything that's not love but what he's saying here what paul is saying distributing to the needs that's doing something about taking care of the saints being given to hospitality for one another even to where those who are outside of the church as rome uh, Next verse, 14 says, bless them persecuting you, and don't curse them. As I gave the example, um, it, in, in my case, where I, uh, the way I dealt with this, this person who had done me wrong, it, I have to tell you a story about that again. I'll add in a little bit to it. Um, it was <clears throat> a few years ago, I, I may have said this before, but I got a phone call from someone, and he said, you know, Mr. Deemer, I saw your program on Beyond Today, and I have to tell you that I was in prison with the man who murdered your daughter. I was his cellmate. I was his cellmate. And they said, I could tell you he is a changed man. And he asked me, would you, would you be interested in contacting him? I said, well, I will give that some thought. It took me a long time to decide what to do. 
And I decided, well, I, I thought, no, it's probably better that I just leave that alone and not say anything to him. But I did, um, eventually the man called me a couple more times. His name was Brian and he lived in the Cleveland area and he'd been in prison with the same man, the same cell for about a year before he got out. I said, I'm gonna send you something. And so I took the court transcripts from that day that I talked to Mr. Hillman in the court and where I, gave, I showed him mercy because as I said, that was the only choice I had. There was no other choice that made sense to me. And <clears throat> I took the page or two or three of the transcript where it had me speaking to him. As you know, the court reporter takes down all of the info as he goes, the court goes along. So my words are written there. I copied those words and I wrote a little note to him and I said, Mr. Hillman, Right where I said, I don't hate you, I never have, not one ounce of hatred. I wrote a little note, I said, Mr. Hillman, I have not changed. I have not changed since I said this. And that's the case. I, to me, God's handled that. God will be the judge and that will be his to determine. And I, I think that at one point I may have a discussion in the kingdom of God with that same man. I think that is very, very likely to happen because God is so merciful. And so he looks at us and he says, look, I want you to be like me. I want you to show mercy to all men. I want that to be in your character as you're always thinking of others outside of yourself. And so we see, again, so much practical application in the New Testament of how to love our neighbor. So let's continue here in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse. <clears throat> and rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Showing empathy for those who ha have good fortune as we celebrated today, CJ's graduation, or, you know, completion of his, his high school, um, someone getting married. We, we went to a wedding last uh, Sunday, this past Sunday, uh, up in uh, the Northeast. It was beautiful. Somebody from our old congregation in New England, beautiful. And it was so good to see old friends there. We rejoiced with them. But there's also the time to weep. As we just heard yesterday, uh, it came in, the prayer request came in that Jenny Bradford had died. I think we all remember Bill Bradford. I think most of us remember Bill Bradford as a longtime elder in the church who um, is now in Australia. Uh, he's, he's an American living in Australia and his wife Jenny of long time had battled cancer and she died this, this a few days ago. It's about a month ago, we were at the GCE, the General Conference, and I saw his son at the GCE because his son, also named Bill Bradford, it, is a pastor in the Chicago area. And I'd been praying about Jenny, his mother, and I wanted to say something to him that ever since her, that prayer request came out for your mom, that she had, terminal cancer, I, I kept her on my on list. Just, just wanted to say those words to him, but it didn't get a chance. I, did, I saw him kind of passing by a couple times, but I just didn't get a chance. But yesterday I sent him a note and just said that, that I'd been keeping your mom in prayer since I first heard that, about her terminal illness. And Will and I met them, uh, Jenny and his, her husband, the senior Bill Bradford about seven or eight years ago and had a nice meal with them at the GCE. Remember, remember how, she, how nice she was, but she's gone now. <clears throat> we know what waits for her, but this was a way for me in my own way to weep with those who weep. We all do that. We all can do those kind of things when we have opportunity. We're not going to be perfect at it, but we, we should be doing these things, thinking about others and praying for them, weeping even 
with them. So he says, as he continues, verse 16, on this very long list of practical application, be of the same mind toward one another. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. And I, I could tell you, I think you'll agree with me, things go a lot better when there's no one thinking more highly of himself than he should be in the church, much better. But God says, don't do that. Let this mind instead be in you, which was also in Christ, quoting from Philippians 2, verse 5. He did not think himself to, um, uh, he did not think himself to, to be above us, but he came and became like us and actually submitted to a life in the flesh, even to his death. At one point during his ministry, Christ rebuked the Pharisees because they were lovers of status. They wanted to be in the best places. They wanted, they loved status. They loved the recognition. And he said to them at one point in his ministry, this is Luke 16, Verse 15, he said, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. He knows what you're like. You justify yourselves before men. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That's Luke 16, verse 15. Don't think of yourselves above what you, you should, what you, ought, what you ought. As Paul continues, verse 17, don't repay evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, if it is possible, as much as lies in you or depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And that can be hard, especially as the times grow harder and we see more um, bad behavior. As it's, it's going to get harder. Uh, to live peaceably. And sometimes, brethren, we just frankly have to remove ourselves from a situation if we cannot do that. If we find ourselves getting too worked up, too intense, we just have to back away. <laughs> I, I like using this example of me driving on the road because I'm the type of guy who, if a guy cuts me off, I want to get, I want to show him a lesson. That's, I can't do that. I can't do that. And, I've, and I, so I, I've learned just take the slower lane and try to keep it around the speed limit. Life is a lot easier over there. Instead of trying to, trying to race down the road and fight for the best spot just seconds above in front of the other guy. That keeps me out of the fray, if you will. I can't, I, because I get too worked, I would get myself worked up. I can't do that. So I stay away, live peaceably with all men. I was using myself. Uh, as another example, I hope my wife would tell, tell you that I'm, I'm not a bad driver. Um, sometimes I do take unnecessary chances, and I've learned over the years, don't do that. You know, try not to do that, but <clears throat> I've, I've gotten a lot better. Beloved, he said, don't avenge yourself. This is continuing, verse 19, uh, still in Romans 12. Don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. That's not your place to lash out and and beat back on somebody. Look at the example of Jesus Christ, how he did when people were beating him. He didn't lash out. He didn't, t you know, take, wind up and, you know, nothing like that. He let himself be taken. Very sadly, he was beaten and scourged and put to death. Uh, but he, he allowed it, he allowed it because he knew that was the only way to show men how wrong sin is, how wrong it is, and what length he would go to to prove that he still loved them, even while they were his enemies. And so therefore he says, verse 20, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on, their head, on his head. Don't overcome, don't be overcome by evil. Don't let it just take over you and you become a part of it. Don't be overcome by it, but overcome evil with good. So this whole section that I've shown you here in, in Romans 12 is always here as a, as a beautiful list. 
of practical application of the law of God. And again, doing these things and practicing them as we have opportunity, and we have much opportunity with everyone we come in contact with, we become more perfect, perfected in love. And that is the fulfillment of the law. That is what binds us together. And so there's an, another major point here, that love is the bond of perfection. Love in the church is the bond of perfection in the church. That's what will make us different from the world. When he gave us his new commandment, Christ said, men will take notice when we fully do it. They'll say, by this, he said, by this they'll know that you are my disciples, the way you love one another, the way you treat one another. And this is what must be different about us. We struggled with unity over the years as a church. We have, I and mean, we've had our church wars if you, and divisions and splits, which shouldn't be so. We struggled with that. We can improve. In fact, brethren, if we're going to be a witness in the last days, we must improve because we can't, God will not use a church that is not bound together in love, all speaking the same thing, in order to preach his gospel to the world. That cannot happen. It won't work. It is not the, <clears throat> the physical things that we do as a church. It's not the physical things like organizing ourselves into Sabbath services. It's not going to feast. It's not all of our, all our camp programs. It's not all the things that we do that brings us together in love. It is fulfilling. Uh, what brings us together is love, binding us together as we lay down our lives for one another. This is what Paul writes about here in Colossians chapter 3. The next verse we'll turn to here in Colossians 3, verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore, he says, verse 12 of Colossians 3, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, those qualities of character that show you the love of, show others the love of God in you. Bear with one another, verse 13. Forgive one another. If you have a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. We practice those things. It binds us together in love. But above all of these things, but above, above all, put on love, verse 14, which is the bond of perfection. Letting the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you are called in one body, and be thankful. So that is showing us that love is the bond of perfection. That shows we are the people of God. The Thessalonians <clears throat> were a good example. So let's turn over to Thessalonians of showing love toward one another. The, uh, their example was known by other churches, as Paul brings out here. In verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you would turn for a couple of verses there, and verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9. <clears throat> and concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do that toward all the brethren who are also, who are in, all in Macedonia, and we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So their example was well known. The, the people knew that they were God's people by the way they treated one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, as Christ said. And it was evident by their example that they certainly were. And God's spirit, of course, was leading them to, to increasing love for one another. And we're, we have that gift of the spirit where we can 
overcome that carnal nature that it is in us that wants to fight against one another instead of showing what God says to do love. Real brotherly love really is being true friends to one another. So Paul continues here in 1 Thessalonians, we'll go to the next chapter, verse uh, 14 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Now we exhort you, brethren, verse 14 of uh, chapter 5 there, <clears throat> warn those who are unruly. It even comes to that in the church. You know, you see a brother walking out of line. What's the godly thing to do? You warn them, tell them, you know, you better get back in line because you love them. You don't want them to fail. Comfort the fainthearted, as Paul continues. Uphold the weak, be patient with all. And see, verse 15, that no one renders evil to evil, evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for both you, yourselves, and for all. And so this is really another way to say, love your neighbor as yourself. Pursue what is good for both yourselves and for all. If it's good for you, it's good for all. And that's really what he's saying is loving your neighbor as you would want yourself to be loved by them. So doing these things <clears throat> promotes the bond of perfection or builds that bond of perfection in the church. And that's what we need to do to be a church that is strong and ready when the time comes, when those, when the things start breaking down all around us. And um, from all indications, we know they will. We don't know exactly when, but we know they will. And people will come and ask questions. And our example will be, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, talking about when we, as a, to be an effective witness, we must show that we are bound together in unity. The love for we have for one another is, as I, I, I said back then, the litmus test, the litmus test of whether we are God's people or not. It is a sin-sick and deceived world, and it's only getting worse. We have, and we will see, continue to see many problems come into the church. How do we deal with all those issues? Well, we have so much instruction in the New Testament, as I've been pointing out. And most of all, we have the example of Christ himself. Christ showed us the new commandment. He lived the new commandment. He told us how to love one another as he loved us. That was the new commandment, that we could see in him the love of God. He told us to love our enemies because he sees the potential in every man. And we were all once enemies of God when we did not keep God's law or did not pursue the law of God. But God expects us, he asks us, uh, commands us to show love all men, to all men, even the unjust. All men are our neighbors. And Christ looked at every one, every man as his neighbor. So he was the perfect example of loving his neighbor. A couple of passages we'll go to in 1 John now as we come to this last point here, that Christ showed us the new commandment. 1 John chapter 2, first of all. 1 John chapter 2. And uh, start there in verse, verse 16, or sorry, verse 6. He who says, verse 6 of 1 John 2, he who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. How did Christ behave? How did Christ treat other men? 
There was not one person who came to Christ for help that he turned away. He endured with all men. He endured patiently with all men. That's how he walked. And if we're going to be like him, if we say that we abide in him, then we must be the same way. Brethren, he writes, verse 7 now, John is writing now, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. In other words, this was always the intent of God's law. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because you are practicing love for one another. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining, the light of God is already shining in us, in all those who practice love toward God and love toward his neighbor to the fullest extent. He who says he's in that light, verse 9, but hates his brother, he's in darkness. In other words, he's a liar. He's in darkness. But he who loves his brother, he abides in the light. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he, verse 11, who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. He's not using the law of God as the guide of his life. He's not looking in that mirror and applying it to himself and saying, what, what, how do I stack up and what must I do to keep the law as I see myself compared to it? What must I do? He's, if he's not doing that, if he's hating his brother, then he's in darkness. He's not looking into that law. He doesn't know where he's going because darkness has blinded his eyes. So John is really very, very plain here, explaining to him, there's just basically two ways to go. Either go the way of light or the way of darkness, the way of good or the way of evil. Well, loving God and our neighbor is all of the law and the prophets, as Christ said on several occasions. So then, verse, uh, Chapter 4 of 1 John. First, a couple more verses here in, in John we'll look at. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, then, as he says, let us love one another, for love is of God. For anyone, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you are doing those things, you are of God. But he who does not love does not know God. For this, for God is love. <clears throat> How do we know what the love of God is? How do we know what love is? Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested. That word, you could say, is shown or is magnified toward us. How do we know what love is? That God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. He was the perfect example, he showed us how to fill, fill the new commandment. This is love, as John says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, indeed, even while we were enemies of God. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so, beloved, as John concludes this passage, if God loved us like that, then we also ought to love God one another, keeping that new commandment, as the title is, the new commandment. If we're going to be a light in the world in the last days, that new commandment must be very evident in our lives. It must be evident in all of our actions toward everyone. It must show in our character People can see it, and we demonstrate it by loving the way we love our neighbor, the way we treat one another. Love does fulfill the law. Love does bind the church in unity, and Christ showed us how to love. He was the fulfillment, if you will, of that new commandment. And finally then, in John 
first John, a couple more verses, verse 20. First uh, John 4, first John 4, <clears throat> verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. He's a liar. He's not telling the truth for how can he not love his brother whom he sees and say he loves God whom he cannot? You cannot see God. You can't look and see him sitting now on his throne. But we know he's looking at us. We know he's looking at our hearts. He know, we know he's looking at the very in thoughts and intents of what we do. He wants to see how we are applying his commandments to ourselves and our lives. We don't see him, but we know he's watching. We know he sees everything. And he's there to help us, of course, because we are weak in ourselves. We all have that human nature that's going to rise up and want to hate want to break the law of God, if you will, break the law of love, and break the new commandment. But God says, this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loves God, verse 21, must love his brother also. That is the new commandment. As Christ said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, and by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 